I just got back from my first convention of the year, and let's talk about it. I'll show you what I picked up at the show, talk about what I didn't pick up at the show, and just kind of give you a general idea of how the weekend went. Let's go. All right, well, like I said, I just got back from my first show of the year. It was in Kansas City for Planet Comic Con Kansas City. Generally, our biggest show of the year, and this year just happened to be the first show of the year on top of that. Needless to say, I've been running around like crazy the last couple weeks getting ready for that show. I'm glad that, you know, we were able to get prepared and... We hit the show, really, and we were in pretty good shape. I had a few things left to do, but I never get it all done. I don't think you can ever truly get it all done. This is a three-day show, and while we were there, it was a little different this year. Honestly, looking back at sales and stuff, Friday was crazy. It was big. In fact, it was our best day of the show, which is very unusual. Typically, the way we see is Friday is just kind of a, a hit or miss. You never really know how it's going to go. But generally, Saturday is always your biggest day of sales. And this year, that just wasn't the case. In fact, we saw sales kind of step down every single day. So Friday was our biggest day. Saturday was okay, but kind of disappointing for a Saturday. But then Sunday was relatively strong. And Sundays can be okay. They can be weak. Pretty rare that a Sunday is your strongest day. Um, but it was just a little different this year. Part of what I think went into that is it seemed like on Saturday, everybody you talked to was talking about how long they'd spent waiting in line for this creator or that creator. And I think the time that was devoted to waiting in those queues really hurt the vendor floor and the fact that, you know, people were waiting two hours in Kevin Eastman's line, then they'd go wait an hour and a half in Roy Thomas's line, however long in Jim Stronko's line, however long in Chris Claremont's line. So there were some hitters uh, as far as the guest list goes at the show, but it really seemed like the, the slow turn times through those queues really sucked a lot of oxygen out of the room for the vendor floor. Now, Friday, like I said, it was the best day of the show, and it seemed like that's when the buying crowd came out. So I don't know if that was just people who knew Saturday was going to be crazy and that they were going to have to devote all this time to those queues, and they did their shopping Friday so they were ready to go on Saturday, or, you know, I, I don't know what else. Maybe that's just when the, the buying crowd was out. Anyway, Sunday, like I said, it was okay. Nothing crazy. Pretty standard, you know, you have a few people who make those last minute decisions. A lot of folks are like, man, I wish I wouldn't have spent all this other money the rest of the weekend so I could have bought XYZ. You know, that just happens every year and it is what it is. Um, I really can't complain. We had a couple of uh, good sales uh, throughout the weekend. Some of the kind of like my crown jewels I had on the wall with Kevin Eastman there for the first time I was able to put out uh, TMNT one through five, just, you know, on a big spread on the wall. I thought it looked awesome. What broke my heart a little bit was when I sold both the number ones I brought with me. I sold the number two, I sold the number five. So for that moment, it was glorious. It was on my wall, but you know, that's the name of the game. You sell comics, you're going to see things walk away that you kind of hate to see walk away. But you know, that's why we're there. And you know, ultimately, I'm glad that they found great new homes. All in all, it was a pretty good year. It's probably our second best year ever. Last year, 2022, was the top dog. We have never had a show as good as that show. And honestly, we're at in a chain of really good performances. So we had doubled our sales a few years ago. We doubled our sales the following year, doubled our sales the year after that. And it was just inevitable at some point we weren't going to be able to continue to see those kinds of massive gains, right, in sales. It also helped that over that same period of time, prices for comics went nuts. So our inventory improved, like the quality of the books that I was able to track down and add to the inventory really took a step up between like 2019 and 2021. And when you couple that with the boom in prices, of course, we were going to have some good years. This year, like I said, we were down a little bit, but coming off the back of our best show ever in a market where prices are generally down 25 to 50%, we were within about 10% of our sales number from last year. So I'm going to take that as a win. Um, of course, uh, if you've been watching the channel, you know that I've just bought some ridiculous stuff from volume wise, from keys wise, you know, just 
I had a lot of great stuff with me, but what I did notice this weekend, and it's something I kind of expected, um, just talking with different people leading into the show and really just leading into 2023 in general, what I saw at this show was a lot of people really hitting the boxes hard. What I had with me was I had two boxes of Golden Age, I had a Walking Dead box, I had a Star Wars box, and I had four boxes of new price is marked and 16 long boxes of my regular price is marked inventory as well as about 16 or 17 boxes of three dollar books so what i found happening is that's where people were spending most of their time and a good chunk of the money came out of the boxes which from a dealer's perspective that's great the stuff in the boxes you know, we're not so hung up on. That's the kind of stuff that's fairly easy to replace. It's the stuff on the wall that, you know, we love to sell it because we get that big ticket ring. But at the same time, it's kind of like, well, crap, how am I going to replace that? Or now I've got to go find one to replace this or replace that. So when things come out of the box, it's it's what we like to see because generally we're having to pay up for the keys, but we get a better profit margin on the stuff that comes out of the box. And I would venture that upwards of half of our sales for the whole weekend came out of those boxes. Every single box was freshly packed. And I mean, like I said, this was our first show of the year. So I had spent many, many weeks leading up to this show, filling in gaps from overstock, pushing in the old new stuff into the regular merged uh, prices mark things. So these boxes were loaded down when we hit the sales floor. And, you know, it's nice when you go to put the lid back on there at the end of the weekend to see all that wiggle room um, that's you know, been put into the boxes over the course of the weekend. That's just really the prices mark stuff. Now, when it comes to the $3 discount stuff, these things, I feel bad and I hate to have to do it, but we always typically throw that stuff down on the floor. And I mean, I'm not a young pup myself anymore. Getting down on the floor, you know, it may be a one-way trip one of these times. Uh, the floor doesn't get any closer the older you get um, but ultimately when you're in these booths at these bigger shows you've got to merchandise every single inch that you possibly can so that's why the three dollar books wind up down there also had a really good book there in fact we probably paid for our booth space with what we sold out of our three dollar discount bins this weekend which is absolutely awesome because that stuff is nice as it is to see things come out of the regular prices mark boxes when you see people building stacks out of your two and three and five dollar bins that's just straight money i mean that's awesome uh from a dealer's perspective so was very happy to see some people hitting those and really working on some of those just foundational runs that's what i keep in those boxes you know that's your your major titles um your common runs just characters people are, or characters and series people are going to be looking for so anytime i see people stacking up you know 30 40 50 books out of that kind of stuff i know that that's somebody who's building a run somebody who's building a collection it's not just the flipper gang out there looking for the next hot book uh that they can flip and make some money off of me but you know i'm fine with that too but generally i try and stay up on that so you know I'm, i try not to be their best friend in that regard that was kind of just my dealer perspective of the show not too bad stick around towards the end and i'll have just kind of some overall thoughts like final thoughts about the show uh, but for now let's go ahead and transition and talk about some of the things I bought or picked up while I was at the show. So really the first thing that happened um, right out of the gate Friday is I knew there was one celebrity um, autograph I wanted to get and I realized it's not comic related but you know I couldn't help myself I was at a comic convention and Truth be told, this gentleman is not getting any younger, so I wanted to take the opportunity to get his autograph, and that is Mr. Bill Daniels. Uh, you might know him as Mr. Feeney from Boy Meets World. So I got this uh, press photo from the original press kit from season one of Boy Meets World, uh, signed by him that weekend. Of course, I splurged for a little extra and got the uh, classic Feeney quote on there. So... For whatever reason, I've been on a bit of a Boy Meets World kick since the holidays. 
So when I saw he was going to be at the show, it's like, yeah, that's a no-brainer. I will gladly get that signature. Now, transitioning over to comics, um, I'm not sure if these two count, but I'm going to show them anyway. Picked up Death Rattle number one. Death Rattle one, there we go. And then Death Rattle two. These are fairly low-grade copies. They're an indie book. They were put out by Kitchen Sink. This is volume one. And the reason I want to pick this up is that Death Rattle 1 has a story in it that some of the plot points were lovingly borrowed for uh, just some basic concepts for the movie Alien. I'm a huge Alien and Aliens fan. And one of the things I've decided to track down is some of those comic book uh, inspiration points that went into the plot of that movie. So, Death Rattle, it's definitely not a kid's comic. Like I said, it's an underground. It's pretty brutal, um, but it's kind of, like I said, it had a role in uh, the plot points to Alien, so I had to pick it up. If you want to know more about that, check it out. It's not for the faint of heart, but uh, there's other books like Weird Science 8 that I'm also looking for that kind of has some um, tie-ins to the Alien plot and stuff like that. So... That one's another one I keep my eyes open for and hope to pick up someday. Then really the only comic I got um, through a trade or anything this weekend was I had this Marvel Super Heroes 20 come into the booth. Um, customer was looking to trade it. He was uh, after some Star Wars stuff that I'd had for quite a while, um, honestly. I wasn't too attached to the Star Wars stuff, and my Marvel Superheroes collection is pretty solid, but naturally, I didn't have issue 20, which is the one book that's actually still holding value, um, and actually kind of jumping a little bit there with all the, the Doom spec and, and stuff that ha has happened in the last 18 months, 12 months, whatever. Um, so, you know, I was pretty happy to swap some of those uh, Star Wars issues, just kind of run fillers from the Marvel series that I'd had for a bit, and the seller was happy, I was happy, so I'm going to call that a win. And, and it's a great Doom cover, I mean, it's just, as, as Doom covers from the 60s go, this is one of the best, for sure. So, happy to pick that guy up. As I mentioned, Kevin Eastman was there, um, it was a big boost, I sold quite a few of my turtle books and those things aren't cheap anymore so that wound up helping our bottom line but i also have this thing where i like to have him do remarks i've i've got a book i'll show here in a second that i always have him do a remark in every year he's here but this year was a little bit different because the last ronin hardcover had come out so i don't like people writing on my comics but hardcovers and stuff i have no problem with so the first thing that happened is i had Eastman do this nice little Last Ronin remark in my Last Ronin hardcover. So now I've got that. I can slide that back on the shelf and uh, it's just that much cooler. And then I've got my IDW Essential Turtles or Ultimate Collection TMNT. And like I said, every time Eastman comes into town, I have him do a new remark in this guy so now i'm up to where i have a mouser which was the first one uh, he did in 2017 i've got a shredder he did in 2019 and then i had him do this utrum or krang this year so villains inside the uh title page there is kind of my thing uh, we brainstormed, and since we're running out of page or running out of space on that page, probably going to move to the back of the book uh, for the next time he comes around, or the next time we're at a, a show, and I'll have him do some heroes in there. So maybe I get like some Casey Jones, Splinter, something like that. Um, so that's kind of a work in progress, uh, something that you know, like I said, it's just I've loved turtles since I was a little bitty kid, so. Anything I can get back to Eastman and kind of enhance, um, you know, just things I have in my collection, 
I'm going to do. I think it's cool. It's fun. It's always a joy to speak with him. He's such a gracious uh, creator, which, I, you know, they always say never meet your heroes, but he's a pretty solid exception to that. He's always been very nice uh, to everybody I've ever seen him interact with. And yeah, his line can be long, but the cool thing when you're waiting in Eastman's line is it's not really like waiting in a queue. You're basically just chilling out with other Turtles fans talking about turtle stuff. Uh, so that really helps make the time pass quicker. So ultimately, that's what I got at the show. Now, once the show started going pretty well, um, at that point, I was like, okay, you know, I'll let myself buy something. Unfortunately, amongst all the dealers that were there, there wasn't a lot of stuff that I was really looking for. Naturally, everybody has the superhero stuff, right? The Silver Age, the Bronze Age. Um, there was even some dealers that had some Golden Age superhero stuff. But outside of my buddy Tom from MSG Comics, who was set up next to me, who had like a wide variety of uh, some pre-code whore, um, pretty solid for, you know, us Midwest guys out here. Uh, there wasn't a lot of that kind of stuff and practically no Tales from the Crypt in the room. Very few ECs in general. And that was one of the main things I was looking for because I'm down to where I need three books to complete my Tales from the Crypt run. So while I was sitting there, I hopped on the eBay and there was an auction that was ending. So got a little mail call here. This just arrived today. So let's pop this bad boy open. I'll show you what I bought. Got a... A Gemini mailer, but absolutely nothing else in the book, so that's not ideal, but, you know, I've seen worse. So what I managed to pick up on eBay while I was just hanging out at the, sh at the show is this Tales from the Crypt number 31. It's a low-grade copy. It's nothing special. It's not one of my favorite covers. Really, the main problem with it is this little stain right here, but for the most part, it doesn't bother me too much. Um, got it at a great price. I think I was in uh, on this thing at $212 shipped, which for, you know, early Jack Davis, Tales from the Crypt, 200 bucks. I'm not going to complain about that at all. Um, it's got a little spine split on it and that stain. And other than that, um, it's really pretty solid for, you know, what it is. It It's over how many years? It's 1952. So yeah, it's uh, 71 years old. We should all look be happy to look this good when we are that age. So check one more off of the Tales from the Crypt list. I'm down to a 34 and 35 are the ones I need. So we will continue the hunt for those. The good times didn't end when I got home on Sunday. Yeah, I mean, it's you get home, you park the trailer, you go inside and you just crash because you're wiped out so Monday you wake up you unload the trailer you take all this stuff back there's always you know comic-con maybe three days long but it starts many days before and ends a couple days after but once I got everything settled went back to work I actually wound up getting a call from a family friend I think it was Tuesday night so since this is still within the week I'm going to include it in my my planet recap so I'd been posting things, and um, this family friend had come into some books. You know, they were at an auction. It was a nice little stack of Golden Age books, mostly from the early 50s, um, which I'm always happy to pick that kind of stuff up because it's getting harder and harder to find. So, and also, I took a little bit of a hit on my Golden Age stuff while I was in Kansas City. Lots of people were hitting that. Like, I have a, a discount Golden Age bin. That took uh, quite a few uh, hits this week. I kept filling it up as the weekend goes, or went on, but um, sold a lot of volume out of that. And then my prices mark Golden Age um, was pretty popular, too. But first up, I got a Betty and Veronica. This is issue number 32. And basically, my rule of thumb with Betty and Veronica, if it's like a swimsuit cover or something like that, you know, I don't mind picking it up. Uh, those seem to be the ones that generally get the most attention. So, not bad there. 
we've got Guilty, number 88, little uh, crime book. And speaking of crime, we've got Crime Does Not Pay. This is issue 99. So this is, I don't know what's going on here, but we've got a couple of giants fighting next to a skyscraper. Pretty wild. Again, it's not the the crazy, there's no like major pre-code horror or crime issues in here, but there's just some fun stuff. Um, and again, Golden Age is just getting harder and harder to find, so you kind of take what you can get in this game anymore. Next up is My Friend Irma, number five. Of course, this is another swimsuit cover, just kind of a fun uh, romance book. I suspect somebody will grab that. There's Golden Age is very niche driven, right? You've got the people who like the horror, who like the superheroes. There's a big group of collectors out there who enjoy the romance, the the teen comics from the Golden Age. Mopsy, Millie, Patsy Walker, all those kind of titles. Big following for some of those. Uh, so while I didn't hit any of those major titles in this, you know, that's right there um, in the same vein. I'm sure somebody who's, you know, that's their their genre, they'll, they'll nab that. I got this True Comics, a Daredevil 102. Of course, this would be the Golden Age Daredevil, not uh, our Marvel Daredevil. And then there were also a few war books in here. So here's an early Our Army at War. It's issue number 25, nice little submarine cover. We've got a Charlton uh, Fighting Army, number 22. Really great color on this one, that red background, if we can get her to focus. There we go. Good looking book. Also got a Blackhawk, this is issue 114. There we go. Next up, we got three issues of Tales of the Unexpected. This is issue 12. Issue 13. And then last is issue 16, which this is actually a DC book that contains a Thor story. So before Marvel's Thor was out on the stands, a Thor story um, featuring, you know, like a traditional um, Norse god Thor, uh, not kind of our, our Jack Kirby Thor that we know, um, was in one of the stories of that particular issue. So that was kind of interesting. Also found a Mr. District Attorney, just a fun... 50s crime uh, series. Strange Adventures 82 is our next book. Not really sure what's going on there, but pretty cool looking. We did have one Adventure Comics. This is issue 234. So a little Superboy action there. This one I, I like. This is a Captain Marvel Adventures. It's late in the series. This is issue 141. Just him kind of Chilling on this small planetoid or space rock, whatever it is. Pretty cool cover. The next two, it's not a title I was familiar with, um, but the second copy, it's just, it's so white, it, it's shocking. Uh, but first up is Gangbusters number 57, just a crime title uh, from DC. Again, like I said, it's not one I was familiar with, but if there's anything I've learned as I've been learning about Golden Age, it's that there's always another title, another cover, another artist. There's, you'll never possibly learn all there is to know about Golden Age stuff because there was just such a huge volume of it. Um, so that's why experts are so few and far between on this stuff. You can have people that really know their niche, but to be able to know everything about the whole Golden Age of comics is... It's a pretty tall order. So 
Last Gangbusters, this is issue 57, and it's just gorgeous, uh, white, just super white. Good looking book. GI Combat 48 is our second to last book. Cool cover, guy hiding under a plane with a, a MIG or something in the background there. And then the big book that came out of this uh, collection, or this little group that I was able to pick up, is showcase number nine. This is the first like solo Lois Lane story. So of course we'd go on, we get Superman's girlfriend Lois Lane later on. This was the issue that kind of proved to DC that, you know, that's a viable title. So showcase number nine, of course, when you get these early issues like that, you're always like, man, why couldn't it have been an eight or a four, um, you know, a 22, land on some of those really big uh, first appearances or early Silver Age appearances of some of the heroes, but you take what you can get. Still a great looking book, uh, several hundred dollars uh, for that particular issue, and it's got great eye appeal. So very excited to have that. So let's go ahead and hit the high points. You know, what were some of my final thoughts uh, takeaways from the show. First thing, the vendors that had the higher prices, they weren't very happy. They weren't selling a lot. There was a lot of price resistance in the room. Um, so vendors that came in with those 2021 prices still on their books, they didn't have very good weekends. And part of the reason is that buyers were actively checking values in real time. They were on their phones, they were digging through eBay, um, GPA, whatever. You know, they were really informed and I think that's great. That's what needs to happen to help encourage some of these prices down. And kind of my last takeaway, I think spec is dead. Like, there were people, I'm sure, buying things they were speculating on, they were picking up this or that. But as a whole, the majority of the people that came to my booth and that I saw buying comics in the room looked like they were buying for their collection. They were building runs. They were, you know, filling holes. They were buying stacks of, of filler books. So maybe we're finally back to where we're buying for our collection, not for that quick flip and easy money. So, like I said, that was Planet Comic Con 2023. Come and see me at my next show, which is Indiana Comic Con in Indianapolis. And that is May 5th, 6th, and 7th, 2023. For now, collect responsibly, and I'll see you in the next one.